Luke chapter 10, the first 11 verses. As with our first reading, I remind all of us that this is the Word of God as it speaks to you. Jesus appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out, send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Amen. May God bless to us and to our understanding, this scripture reading. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I know we still have communion, and I know some of you are excited at getting out and going and having lunch with friends or quickly going and seeing the last few minutes of the U.S. women's national soccer team winning, I hope, knock on wood, uh, against their opponents, the Netherlands. So let me just take a few minutes here. I'll try to be quick. A little girl one time was asking her mother, Mommy, do all fairy tales start with the words, once upon a time? And her mother shook her head and said, Honey, I'm sorry, no. Most fairy tales today start with these words. If I am elected. <laughs> Thank you. Now you may be asking yourself, well, what does that have to do with things that I'm about to talk about, and it's probably politically incorrect, and I do apologize if it is, especially in today's climate, but Jesus and politicians have more in common than you'd think. Simple little example is right here. Jesus made promises. Not like the ones our politicians make, but Promises about having a new life in God's kingdom. Now after hundreds of years of foreign domination, Israel wanted to return to the good old days. The days of David and Solomon. The days of glory. The days where they were a kingdom unto themselves. And they wanted that kingdom restored. That was the expectation of the people in Jesus' day. Some saw this happening through a person, a Messiah, one anointed, appointed by Yahweh, 
by God. Others saw it as being more of a messianic movement where God's reign would emerge, where freedom and prosperity would abound, where righteousness, justice, and peace would become commonplace. And whether it was with one person or a movement, what was the underlying theme was the people wanted change. And they wanted it neatly packaged in a neat, clean, little messianic box, if you will. This is the historical and sociological context that Jesus was facing as he was starting in his ministry. These were the expectations that Jesus walked into with a message about God's kingdom being at hand. And he's trying to say that with it comes a new, yes, I dare say even a better life being made available to the people who would embrace it. So Jesus is proclaiming this new life. But his challenge is trying to get that message out to the people so that they would not just know it, but they would understand what he was saying. But how does one announce the kingdom of God is coming? How do you shift expectations without losing interest? And how do you package it in a way the people understood what you were actually saying? Politicians, CEOs, and church leaders can learn from Jesus here and learn how to do what it is we are to do. Because frankly, many of us don't do a good job doing what we say we're supposed to be doing when it comes to the church. Jesus knew that to get the word out meant he needed to use the leadership around him in order to move the minds of the people. And this wasn't a new concept. Please understand this. God gave this leadership model first to Moses. And now Jesus is taking it, tweaking it a little, expanding it somewhat, and turning it out in the form of 35 teams going out into the hinterlands, the, the byways, the towns, the crossroads, the intersections, and sharing the good news of the gospel. What Jesus was doing was delegating. Now, if you listen to my children, they think delegating is easy. It's dad just saying, listen, would you do this and would you do that and take care of this and I'll see you later. But it's a lot harder than that, isn't it? Delegating, especially in a volunteer organization like the church, is challenging at best. It's also not easy for a talented person to ask talented people to do something the way she or he expects them to do it. Usually ends up that the person either does it himself or herself, or they get frustrated and they turn it around and it just becomes chaos and not very manageable chaos. Anger emerges, frustration height is heightened, misunderstandings occur, 
resentment takes place and the whole thing falls apart. And when it comes to the church, we try to do the tried and true. I shouldn't call it that. We try to do our own old method. What I like to refer to as the bless you two-step. We bless you and we move on real quick. We have good intentions. We want to teach. We want to encourage. We want to uh, guide. But in our good intentions, we water everything down so that it all becomes very wishy-washy and ends up being nothing. We do a lot, but we accomplish very little. And in the process, we get very exhausted. While feeling good about ourselves and how we think we did things, the message that we're sending out is a message of irrelevance and ineffectiveness. Now, I mentioned earlier that Jesus, in essence, borrowed this from Moses. Back in Numbers and in uh, Deuteronomy and in Exodus, Moses was trying to do everything himself. And it was crazy. Finally, a cooler, more experienced head spoke to Moses in the form of Jethro, his father-in-law. Jethro basically said to him, Moses, you can't do it all yourself. You need to share the leadership. You need to be partners. And you need to delegate. And so Moses picked 70 elders. And that's when things started to begin to function properly. And that's the message of the gospel today. A shared ministry that we are all to be doing. They were the leaders, the messengers, the proclaimers, the teachers, the guides, the mentors, whatever term you wish to use. And today, we're to be those same people. The leaders, the mentors, the guides, the teachers, the proclaimers. And by doing that, we will get things done. Part of your ministry here at Westminster Presbyterian Church is to be delegated to and to delegate. Doing both, it's not a either or. It's teaching the tools and the gifts and learning new tools and new gifts so that everyone succeeds in living out the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Your age doesn't matter. Your skill set, though important, isn't primary. What does matter, though, what is needed, is your faith. And your audience is anyone and everyone you meet. Not just here, but outside of these doors. And your goal is to share with them who you are through your actions, through your kindness, through your compassion, that you are a child of the living God, a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, everything I've said up to this point isn't new. But it is worthy of attention. Tom Peters, who wrote a book called Thriving in Chaos for Business Leaders, said that successful corporations today decentralize, delegate, and encourage creative synergy. What he's basically doing is taking a biblical formula, 
He doesn't know it. But taking a biblical formula and applying it to today's secular organizations. And I was reminded of this just the other week when Vacation Bible School was starting up here. I was standing back in the narthex talking to people as they would come in, greeting them. And after things were getting started, I was standing there talking to a young mother. And in that conversation, this mother was sharing with me some of her experiences in her corporate world. And as she talked on and on about them, I found myself internally smiling because what she was talking about is what the church is all about. That's how we do church. We just don't recognize it or acknowledge it. This is why I believe God wants us to reclaim these life-affirming models, not only for our lives, but for the church's life, because they work. We know these biblical models. They've been co-opted by the secular world because they work. The trouble is that the church has taken these models that are really part of its heritage and somewhere along the line we've labeled them as being irrelevant, archaic, old school. For whatever reasons we've done that. And maybe to some extent they are. But maybe we've rejected them or we've pushed them aside because they scare us. They scare us because they call us to be in commitment, to be responsible, to be engaged. Maybe we're being asked to reclaim the biblical formulas that we know are there, that are tried and true, not only for the church, but for our own lives. As I tend to look at the church in the broader context, I sometimes think that the church has a default key that we need to delete. And the default key is stuckness. We get stuck. And we become so stuck, we become inactive, and we become so inactive that we become lethargic. Lethargic and we don't do anything. Maybe we do need to delete that default key and replace it with team delegation. Now, I must confess to you, I got you to blow it this morning. I got you to blow what normally happens in the church. That old default that I just mentioned, you've admitted, you've accepted the fact that you will not do it. You will not allow yourselves to get stuck. You will accept, is what I heard you saying, team delegation for young Leighton. You promised her, you swore to her this day that you would guide her, you would nurture her, you would love her, you would pray for her, you would teach her, you would forgive her, you would embrace her, you would do everything you could for her so that one day she would stand before you and profess her faith in Jesus Christ. That is the delete key being hit on the old default, stuckness. So what you've done 
today is that you have promised to do church, to actively do church. So let's get on with it and not mess around anymore. For Leighton's life and for every other child's life in this congregation and every other person's life sitting next to you. Because this is something we need to be serious about. In the name of God, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Savior. Amen. Would you please stand as we affirm our faith using these words from the Confession of 1967, declaring to ourselves and also to one another that God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of human mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But God reveals his love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful humans. The power of God's love in Christ to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of his love. Amen.